Well, good morning. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Who's excited to be here? All right, good, good, good. We got some little treats today. Hope you're excited. Oh, today uh, we are going to be taking communion. In fact, the, the whole service is actually going to be a little different. The way that we do communion today is going to be a little unique. And so um, I hope you're excited. It's, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. And you already said you were excited, so you're, you're locked in, right? Right, right. So uh, today is, if you don't know, Palm Sunday. And it's a wonderful day that we get to celebrate. Um, as Jesus was entering in Jerusalem, there was a giant celebration. And so today, we're going to celebrate. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, before we do all that celebrating, though, a couple, couple of announcements really quick. Uh, there is going to be an open house for anybody that wants to come. But on this April 16th, open house right after service at 1230. If you're interested in coming and being here, we're going to have some food and stuff. There's a little sheet back there in the back. If you'll just write your name down, that way we can have an idea of how much food to, to have prepared. Um, because if, I mean, if you write your name down and you don't come, Jesse and I will still eat all of it, and that's okay. So, now just give us a heads up. We, we want to provide that time uh, just for some open Q&A, kind of tell everybody that comes a little bit about who Rock Creek Family Church is. Um, we just want to be transparent, open, and honest. Maybe you have some questions, and we want to provide an opportunity for those questions to be answered. So um, come on out, write your name down on the back. That's going to be a good time. Also, tickets, tickets for the grill. I don't know if you put your ticket in. You probably didn't put in as many as I did, so if you don't win, I'm sorry. No. Tickets for the grill. Just to give you guys an, a quick update, um, the sales that we've reached out is right around $4,000. And then there's actually an additional donation for right around another 4000 or so. So that's close to eight or so. Yes. Um, and all that's going, all of that money is going towards the building and getting the building finished out. So I just want to say thank you to everybody that has participated. And that's still going. That's going on through the end of the month, I believe. So um, if you want to get your name in you want to get, or you want to help get some tickets sold, you still have some time for that. Um, all right. Y'all ready to get into worship? Y'all ready to get into what God's got in store for us today? I come expecting. I came expecting. I hope you did too because God's going to move in this place. He does every Sunday. But today I feel like there's something special and probably because we're taking some special communion time. But I do feel like something special. So I'm going to share this quick scripture. If you want to go ahead and stand as we get ready to worship. I thought I would read the entire passage of the triumphal entry, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to share this part. Verse 9, Matthew 21. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So today we get to celebrate. Today we get to sing Hosanna in the highest and shout praise to God as we worship. So let's do that this morning as we go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, just ready to worship you, God, ready to to sing praise, God. So many years ago, as your son Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, there was a shout of praise. And God, we just, God, we come into that shout of praise. We join, God, with the angels. Even now, God, as they praise your name, Lord, we sing the mighty shout, Hosanna in the highest, Lord. Today and for all days, Lord, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Let's worship this morning.
Come on, give him a hand today, church. Yeah, we love you, Lord. We, we love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. We praise your holy name. We give you glory today. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We have tasted and we have seen that you are good. We know, Lord, that through experience that you've walked with us and been so faithful time and time and time and time again. So, Lord, we celebrate that today. Today is, it is a reminder. It's a reminder of all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do for us and how that propels us into what and how we are to serve you and your people, your church, the people of this world even in some cases. So, Father... I pray, Lord, that you would bring us, Lord, under a complete understanding of how much you love us. Bring us, Lord, into a tangible expression of remembering who you are and what you've done. I want to thank you today for all who are in this building. I want to thank you for those that are excited about what you're doing in this earth. What you're doing right now, is, I know the media says otherwise, but I'm telling you, you are on the move. You are on the move, Lord. You are moving, and we are just so thankful to be a part of it. So, Father, we love you, and we give you praise. And if you love him, turn to about five people and tell him you're glad to see him today. I know it's dark, but you can still count to five. So good to have you here today. Yes, it is going to be a little bit different, as you can already tell, and as uh, Pastor Jonathan has already expressed, a little bit different, and that is because um, when we do take communion, we want like the whole service to really surround the idea of that. And that's really the heart of why we are doing it different today. It's really the heart of why the service will be different today. It's not something that we just want to do because it's just something that you do, and this is what churches do. We just do it, we move on. This is something that we want to really, really remember what Jesus has done for us. What a sermon illustration that you guys get to partake in in just a few minutes. We'll have a, a very special guest preacher who's going to preach for a few minutes for us today, too. I'll let you in on some of that here in just a minute. So because we are going to be a little bit different, we've, we've got this the first part of worship down. We've set this atmosphere. And then what we're going to do is go on with the rest of the service with uh, the children's church going, the offering in children's church like we normally do, you know, three or four songs later, two or three songs later. Um, we're going to let them go do their thing so that we can bring them back and do the rest of our, our worship while we take communion. And we figured that would be an awesome way for families to be able to get to do this together. And you're actually going to see even more of a reason why we want everybody to be together during that time. So having said that, before we take time to let the children's church go, let's go ahead and get our offering. Let's get that and take that and pray over that. And then we're going to get on with what the rest of what God has in store for us today. So if you have your offering, let's hold that in our hand and let's bless that, that you have actually the ability to ask God to bless what you're giving. Not out of selfishness, but out of 
the understanding that you're giving from what he has already given you and you're just returning it back to him. You realize that it's not yours anyways, right? How many of you understand everything you have is not really yours anyways? That God's given you the ability to have what you have. And so we're just returning a portion back to say, God, we give you our first fruits. We return this back to you because we want to honor you with that. Believing and trusting that the rest is going to be blessed by you. So, Father, I do pray over the first fruits that are going to be given here today, over any offering given here today, over every single dollar. God, it's all yours. Lord, you've blessed us to be a blessing to your kingdom. And Father, what a way that we can invest in, in what you're doing in such a way that eternally we're going to see those investments keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. So Father, what an honor it is to be a part of your kingdom today. What an honor it is to be a part of your church today. What an honor it is to serve you in whatever way I can. And this is just one way. So, Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we ask God a blessing over everyone that's able to give today that you pour back into their life. God, blessings spiritually and physically and financially, emotionally, just pour back into them as they're trusting in you today. We love you, Lord, and we give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you can, go ahead and come on up right now and give that. this time we're going to let children's church go <laughs> and as they're going can Easton can you hit the lights on real quick hopefully I won't shock you too bad there you go thank you appreciate y'all back there helping us out appreciate you very much all right so thankful so thankful you could be seated in his presence now. So today we have something very special. It's always special when you don't have to listen to me too often. But uh, we're, I'm going to share the stage, share the podium with Brother Ryan Rooney today that took time and took time because he really wanted to he desired to he wanted to bless the church today as they always do he and wendy always do but so he wanted to make the matzah for our communion today and he did so and so he slaved you ever seen that commercial where the where the lady has got all the flour in her hair and in her on her face and she's rolling out rice krispie treats well he had flour in his beard yesterday he worked enslaved over it all day. No, he, he wanted to bless us with this, and I appreciate that very much. Appreciate what he has done. So I invited him to come and just kind of share from his heart, his perspective about the bread and about the, the, the Lord's Supper, anything that he wanted to share with you from that, with maybe what the Holy Spirit wants to speak through him. So I do appreciate him doing that. appreciate you and Wendy being a part of the church and coming and, and serving the way that y'all do. We love you so much, and we appreciate you. So at this time, let's welcome Brother Ryan as he comes up. And he gets ready to share. Oh, hi. Good morning. I'm going to put glasses on because I need those now. So, uh, Pastor asked me to uh, kind of tell you guys why I got kind of excited about Passover, what it meant to me, uh, and it's kind of part of a broader story. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did, it was actually during COVID, we did a, uh, a, 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 whole, a whole study on Revelation, and it completely opened my eyes to a lot of different things, and, and, and it, it led the way to uh, learning more about what 
God did in the Old Testament. The Revelation will take you through the whole Bible. It's, it's completely connected, and it's absolutely amazing. And the thing that really got me, what um, was so uh, overwhelming to me is that I've realized I'm just a, a sucker for a redemption story. And it turns out I'm not the only one. God loves a redemption story. And this entire Bible is a redemption story, and it's a love story to us. And that's what was opened up to me. And this supper that we're going to have today is a redemption story. And Jesus celebrated this supper um, prior to what he revealed to us as he fulfilled this supper. So we're going to kind of go back and look a little bit. I'd like to read a couple passages because nothing I can say would be any better at all uh, than what, Jesus, what God had to say. So I'm going to be starting in Exodus uh, 12, right at verse 1. I just want to read a few lines of this and discuss this, and then we'll move to the New Testament and see what Jesus did uh, with the Passover. The Passover is a very big deal. I forgot to write this one thing down, but I believe it's mentioned in the Bible 71 times or 77 times. I can't remember. I think it was 71. Um, it's all throughout this, and many of the great things that God did and Jesus did was on Passover. It's all connected. It's a big day for the Lord, and that day's coming up. Today's Palm Sunday. Today is the, uh, the tenth day of the month as the Hebrew calendar goes, and we're going to read about that here in just a second, what that meant with the lamb. The lamb is so important. Um, but on the fourteenth day and fifteenth day, uh, that is where we start the Passover feast, which is a seven-day feast. Um, so the cedar is what we're going to be celebrating today, and that is the first meal in the order of that meal. Uh, so I want to begin by reading this and what the, uh, what the Jews would have been doing with this. And this is what, what Jesus would have been doing that day of his Last Supper. He would have been going over all of these different things that we're going to read about right now. And in verse 12 in Exodus starting in verse, uh, sorry, chapter 12 starting in verse 1, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, The month is to be set for you the first month, this month. Uh, the first month of, the, of, the, of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day, that's today, by the way, of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share one with their neighboring, uh, nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are determined the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be uh, a year old male uh, without defect. And you may take from them the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they will take these, uh, the, the, some of the blood and put it on the sides of the doorposts and the, uh, and the door frames in the house where they eat the lamb. That same night, they are to eat and roast the, um, and, uh, eat the I'm sorry, eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with the bitter herbs and the bread made without yeast. Do not eat the raw meat or boil, um, or boil in water, but roast it over a fire with the, uh, with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some, of you, if some is left in the morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked in and your belt and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste as uh, it is the, the Lord's Passover. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both uh, people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all of God's Egypt, all of, uh, uh, all of the gods in Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on your houses where you are and where you are when, when, and where I see the blood. I will not pass over. Uh, I, I will pass over. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. It's all about the blood, and that's what he was telling us right here, is that this blood is so important. And today we're going uh, to partake of the, the uh, bread that it, they talk about. We're going to have the wine that, that uh, that'll be what we're going to read about. Right, wine is very interesting. There's lots of different cups of wine. We're going to go over those real, real quick. Um, all of these different bitter herbs are mentioned, but the lamb is really the main thing. And really today, what you don't see really here, but is in the room, is the lamb. And they don't celebrate the lamb today the same way that they did back then uh, because they can't. They don't, the temple's not there, so they can't sacrifice the lambs as they would typically do. So what they do is they bring a bone of the lamb. They bring a shank bone, and they put it on the table. 
And that's how they remember that lamb. And that lamb was the lamb that was slain for them, that they took the blood and they put it on their doorposts, not on the sides. Well, that blood is the tent of the house, right? It's the tent. God put that on, the, we, the Jews would put that on their tent. Today, Jesus puts that blood on our hearts. And that's how it's fulfilled through that. And we're going to read about that in just a moment. Uh, and that's what Jesus was trying to tell. It must have been absolutely revolutionary for them to hear what, God, what Jesus had to tell them on that day um, that we're celebrating right now. So I'm going to kind of fast forward, and we are going to go to, uh, we're going to read the Matthew one. So we're going to read uh, um, Matthew uh, 26, starting at 26. And then we're going to go over what this meal is really about. All right. So in Matthew 26, starting in t- verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. When he had given them thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat this. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of, um, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until uh, that day when I drink it with an... Um, drink it new with you in my father's kingdom so jesus is fulfilling the passover as he actually fulfilled all of the feasts of the lord the passover is the redemption feast and so there's a lot of different things that kind of go into this and i'll just kind of start let's start with the lamb so we, we kind of talked about that with the bone and today we would take that bone and we would have it on our table and that would be the lamb of god although we have that in our hearts and he is the lamb, the true lamb, the, the, the one sacrifice. We never have to sacrifice again a lamb or any other animal because Jesus had already taken care of that for us, for our sins. All we have to do is believe in that, and that's our redemption. It's all on the blood of, of Jesus Christ. Um, the other thing that they would put on their table is an egg, and that egg would remind them that uh, of a sign of mourning, which we do over Christ, but also is a symbol of hope and resurrection that egg would have on there. Um, and then they had bitter herbs. And so you may have heard that before. We read it in Exodus. And those bitter herbs were designed to talk about the bitterness of slavery. And whether you knew it or not, you were a slave to sin, right? But you've been freed. If you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been freed from that sin. And now we can take of the bitter herbs and remember of who we were and what Jesus did for us to bring us out of slavery, just as he did, just as God did with Egypt. See, Exodus was a huge dress rehearsal for what Jesus did. And all of the Old Testament stories, all that the Jews went through, were to show us what God was going to do again. And you can read all those stories and apply it to what Jesus fulfilled. And, and uh, this is one of the best ones. The Passover is just amazing, all the different things. So we have the bitter herbs. And then we get to the salt water. And I want to talk about the salt water and the parsley, because they would have salt water and parsley. Oh, anybody ever heard of hyssop? Anybody know what hyssop is? Hyssop was a, it, it was a, it was a, uh, a cleansing uh, a tool that they would use. And what they would do is they would dip it in blood in the temple, like the lamb. When they sacrificed the lamb, they would dip the hyssop in. Uh, it was like it looked kind of like this, but this is parsley. And they would dip it in that, and then they would sprinkle on the altar and they, on the um, on the ark and all of those different things, right? As a cleansing tool, it was also used to do the last cup of wine, which we're going to talk about as the uh, Roman soldiers would dip it into vinegar wine and lift, lift it up to Jesus' lips. And this represents that. So this is a very important part of the dish as well, is parsley. Uh, so I kind of wanted to bring that up because all this stuff is just so amazing. Um, so you would purge uh, ourselves and cleanse ourselves with the hyssop. So they would dip this. Now what they would do is they'd have a cup of salt water and a piece of parsley at their table, and they would dip it in the, into the salt water, representing the blood, which is what the salt water was, and also the hyssop, as if they were to that cleansing, and they would they would eat. And then I wanted to get to, uh, let's see. Let's just talk about the matzah. So the matzah is the Passover bread, and that's what we're here today. We have here, this is what I, I made yesterday. And I want to tell you, um, we know that it's very, very special. You need to make it. You need to make it at home, and you can do that. It's very, very simple. There's really only two ingredients. This, this, uh, this matzah has three ingredients. We've added a touch of salt, and we also added a touch of oil. Anybody know what oil represents? 
you know, in the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. That's in this bread as well. But the thing that you do when you start making the bread is you have to make it very, very fast. Because that was the reason why they had to have their sandals on their feet. They had to have their staff ready. They had to be dressed to go because it happened that quickly. They had to get out in Egypt. Uh, get out. And that, that was the whole point. So they would be ready to go and they had to make their bread fast. They couldn't. That's why there was no leaven. Anybody know what the leaven represents? It represents sin. Jesus had no sin. This bread represents our Lord, Jesus Christ, with no sin in it. So uh, when you're making it, you have to make it within 18 minutes. Because they had to go through, they had this whole ritual where they would go, the, 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 the wife of the house would go through the house and have to make sure every bit of leaven is gone. And I used to think that they had like yeast jars and stuff like that. They didn't have yeast jars back then. The yeast is in the air. The, all, that, all that leaven is in the air. And so what they would do, though, is they would, when they would make a loaf of bread, and it was leavened bread back in the day, they would take a pinch of it, and they'd put it off on the shelf, and they'd leave it there to when they made the next loaf of bread, and then they would add that little piece in. That little lump affected the whole batch, right? That little bit of sin affected the whole batch. That's how they would make their bread. But for this Passover, what they would do was they would have to go through their house and find every piece of those little pieces of bread that they had and get rid of it and burn it. And it was kind of a fun thing. This was a, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, people practiced this as a very fun thing. So the wife would go through and find all these different things. And then after she was done, the husband was supposed to go and find any crumb that she had left. And the kids would watch dad go through the house and make sure he's finding it. And the wife would hide a couple of pieces that he had to find and like, oh, I found that piece she left. So it was kind of an uplifting fun thing that they would do to get, make sure all the leaven was out. And it would also um, compel them to get rid of all the leaven. And then they would go out and they'd burn that leaven. So you have to make it very, very fast. Uh, the air will affect the bread within 18 minutes, so you have to go quickly. Uh, so what you have to do is the second the water touches that bread, you've got 18 minutes to make it. It's plenty of time, really, but when you get going, it gets very hectic. You're watching the clock the whole time, and you have a, a thought of what the Egyptians went through. But your next thought goes to how fast you're making it, and you start to think about how you're tearing apart that bread, and you're kneading it, and you're crushing it. And you, I started to think about that being Jesus' flesh as you're making it. It's a very violent uh, thing that you're doing to that bread. You're kneading it and pinching it and pulling it and, and, and putting the, the rolling pin to it and crushing it. And then you're piercing it. And we're going to talk about those things. But as you're thinking, as I was thinking about how bad the, the, it must have been for those Romans to do that and for the Jews to do that, I realized I'm doing it to the bread at that very moment. This is Jesus who died for my sins, and it made it very personal. These uh, these um, um, uh, rituals or, or uh, ceremonies that the Jews would do with all this were really not meant for a big congregation. They were meant for a family. He wanted all the families to participate in this. So everyone would get their lamb and they would figure out how many people they could do because they had to burn what they didn't eat. So they had to make sure they were eating a whole thing. Um, and they would make this bread together and do this in the household. So it was a very personal thing. And when you make it, and you can make it this Wednesday because Tuesday, Wednesday is, is the true Passover for us. You can make this with your family. And when you're making it, just remember what you're doing to that bread is what we did to Jesus on that cross. And that's what really brought it to me. So when you're doing it, you're going to put the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the flour in the bowl. Then you're going to put a little bit of salt. Then you're going to add the water. And then you're going to add a little touch of oil into it. And then you're going to start kneading it until it turns into a, a ball. You're going to throw it on the table. And you're going to use that rolling pin and roll it out flat. And then you're going to take a knife or something. And you're going to pierce it. And so when you see it, there would be little holes all throughout this to make sure it burns and cooks crisp all throughout the whole bread. And so you're piercing it just like Jesus was pierced on that cross. They have other rituals. I don't think I'm going to go into those today. They're very interesting, though. Uh, I do recommend that you, you dive deeper into what all the, is done with this bread. Um, they, had, they have a, a three-sleeve um, sheet that they use, and the middle sheet is Christ. It's, it's very, very interesting, but it would take a little bit of time. I need to get to the wine because the wine is also very interesting uh, and amazing. So the wine, we celebrate it as the, the blood that was poured out by Jesus Christ, right? So did you know that they, they drank more than one cup of wine? They actually drank four cups of wine. They were all at different parts of the meal. So the first one would be at the very beginning of the cedar, which is at the beginning of the meal. It's really before they even get to the meal. It's really at the beginning where they all gather together and they would drink that first cup. The first cup was a cup of sanctification. 
It was a, and these are, all these cups are based off of God's promises. And that was the promise, I will take you out. That's a good promise. Um, they would praise and worship God at this time, so they would drink that first cup. Jesus would have maybe drank that first cup. There's a little bit of, we don't know, Jesus said he wasn't going to touch that wine, right, until there's the new wine with us. That's coming up soon, I hope. Uh, and then uh, there's a second cup, and this is just before the meal. And that cup is the, is, is the cup of telling forth, of praise and deliverance. Praise, I will, sir, um, the, the promise is, I will save you. Amen, he has saved us. This is a very important cup. This is a, a reminder of the ten plagues. The Jews would, would take this wine as a reminder of the ten plagues and the suffering that they, they had. They would spill a drop of it, and they would recite the ten plagues. That was part of that, that dinner that they did. The dinner wasn't just eating. They would talk, and Jesus would have talked at that time. I always was very curious what it would have been like to sit with Jesus. You know, I see pictures of the Last Supper, which is not really very accurate. They would have been lounging down and discussing and talking. They would have been singing songs, and they would have been praying, and they would have been praising God during this time. But here it is. We're to the third cup. The third cup is a very, very important cup. And this was taken after the meal. So this is where Jesus says, this is the cup, by the way, of the new covenant. This third cup is the cup that we're going to be drinking today. It is the cup of the blessing of redemption. It's a promise, I will redeem you. And indeed he has. If the Lord, if you have believed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have come to him, and you have accepted him as your savior, this cup was for you. This cup is to be drunk by you. And to remember that he has redeemed you. Your story of redemption, by the way, is so important. It's so valuable to others. You know, God built us to enjoy those stories of redemption. We are made to hear them, and when we hear them, we get excited. I get very, very excited when I hear how somebody came to the Lord. It's very exciting to me. And uh, I encourage you guys to tell your stories. There was a way that the Lord came to you that was unique to you. Some of them aren't very splashy or amazing in, in a way that would, you know, they might write a novel about it. But... He did something in your life that was absolutely amazing at that time, and he transformed you in the blink of an eye. Uh, because of your faith, he did all the work on the cross, and because of his blood, you are redeemed. And that's what this cup's about. So it re it's a reminder to the Jews of the blood that was shed for the innocent lamb. Well, we had an innocent lamb. He didn't sin, and he died on that cross. Uh, there was the fourth cup is the cup of completion. This was a unique cup to Jesus. He didn't drink it that night. That cup came a little bit later. He did drink that cup. He drank it when he was on the cross. And they lifted up that hyssop. And they dipped it in vinegar wine. And they lifted it to his lips. And when he took that wine on his lips, that's when he said, it is finished. That is the cup of completion. It's an amazing cup. And Jesus did it. He did it. There was one other cup that they had. It's an interesting cup. It's not one of the four. It's a, it's a fifth cup that they left for Elijah. And this is what the Jews would do. They would put a cup on the table and they'd fill it up. And they would think Elijah is going to come back tonight and drink that cup. So they left it for Elijah to come through the door and drink the cup. And Elijah was supposed to come and tell them that the Savior is coming. He was supposed to announce it. Well, we know that that did happen. It's already happened. So the Jews were always disappointed with this cup, and they'd end up pouring it out at the end of the night, and they'd say, well, maybe next year. But Elijah did come in the form of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist heralded that out. The Lord has come. And so that cup has already been partaken. Um, anyway. Yeah. I think that's what I had to say to you guys today. Thank you very much. Come on, one more time, give him a hand. He put in a lot of work there. <laughs> Brother, I could have just listened to that the rest of the time. I love that. I love the, the cultural aspect of it, the going back and seeing it, not, not through our eyes and our perspective, because sometimes that's a little skewed, but to go back and look through that perspective. Perspective is very important, amen? perspective is very, very important. Um, I'm not going not gonna to belabor too long coming and doing our, 
our time of communion. But I do want to pull out two things. First thing is, is I know normally we do this on Easter Day, and we're not doing communion on Easter Day this year because this year on Easter Day, we want you to celebrate the resurrection. We want you to celebrate how the power of the Holy Spirit has freed you and set you free to be able to be who he's called you to be. So before that, before you can have a resurrection, you have to have a cross. Before you can come to the place where Jesus raises you up, and what we learned a few Wednesday nights ago, when Jesus raises you up, you give all you have, and Jesus raises up more than you are. But before we get there, we decided to take a day and just remember. And I know it fell on Palm Sunday, as it always does before Easter, but in thinking about why we're choosing today, to do communion on Palm Sunday instead of throwing palms at one another or whatever it is. While we're doing that today is because when Jesus rode in on that day, he rode in already triumphant, right? Prophetically so, already triumphant. That's why we call it the triumphal entry. That he rode in triumphant. He rode in victorious. And that victory didn't look the way that some people thought it ought to have looked. Because he rode in on the colt, the foal of a donkey. In other words, he rode in lowly, humble. He rode in proclaiming peace. And while everyone else is throwing their palm leaves down, and everyone else is throwing their, their outer garment, their outer covering, their outer cloaks down and riding over that. And they're singing Hosanna, as Pastor Jonathan had already mentioned earlier today. They're singing Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is our King, King Jesus. As they're singing that and saying that and praising that and proclaiming that. And he rides in, he knows what is just ahead of him. He knows what is just ahead of him. And so hearing the praises of the people sets him up to remember himself what, is he about, what he is about to do. And I want to turn to you a couple of passages of Scripture. Luke chapter 19 and verse 27. We're going to read this just before he does the triumphal entry just before he rides in this is as he's coming out of jericho which we actually talked about i think last week a couple weeks ago he's coming out of jericho heading toward jerusalem going into jerusalem and he gets stopped and he he heals the two blind men blind bartimaeus is one of them he also does the famous zacchaeus story where he tells Oh, Zach, to come down out of that sycamore tree. And he goes to his home, and he is blessing him there in his home. And that was a, that was a big thing that always stuck out with me whenever I started t thinking and studying about the Passover is salvation and redemption came to the family. It came to the family. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit, but just hold on to that, family. Rock Creek family, church, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, your family. For some of you, that's scary. For some of you, you're good with that. So as he is about to head into Jerusalem in this triumphal entry moment, he stops and he teaches another parable. It's called the parable of the minus. I'm not going to get into the whole parable. But the parable is kind of like the parable of the talents where he says he gave one, some, you know, one five talents, one two talent, one one talent. On this one is called a minus. He says it's in Luke, he calls it a minus. So he, he says this parable again. This is another time he's taught this parable. So it's almost like, hey, get the picture. I'm using this parable two or three times. I want you to get this. And in this parable, he says, a man came 
to redeem his kingdom, to get a kingdom going. And he did so by starting out and giving some stuff away. We call it minus or talents or money or gifts or whatever. He gave it away and he said, now go use it. And when I return, I'm going to ask to see what you've done with what I've given you. And so in that parable, he, he says that. He says, what have you done? He says, as the man has given that out, and they take that and they put that to work, and then the man who's going to proclaim his kingdom and go get, come, come back and get his kingdom in Christ is coming back to get his kingdom. Amen? Y'all ready for that? Okay, get ready. <laughs> get ready, right? So in this parable, he says, as the man comes back and he talks to the one he gave a minus, which is about three months worth of money. And he says, what have you done with it? He said, here, look, I've made more for you. We, we, we've made a profit. We, we've done something with it. He says, good job. You've been faithful over a few. I'm going to make you ruler over many. I'm paraphrasing to move on. But he says it to another one. He says, what have you done with it? He says, hey, I've done the same thing. I've doubled, I've doubled what you've given me. I've, I've put it to work. So to stop there, I'm going to ask you, what have you done with what Jesus has given you? Let me back up a little bit further. Do you realize what Jesus has given you? Ah, uh, now you're understanding why we're doing communion today. To remember what Jesus has given you. Is that ringing a bell? What has he given you? Well, everything. Everything. He held nothing back for you. Nothing. Not one drop of blood he held back for himself. He gave it all. But then he goes at the end of the parable and says something crazy interesting to me. And this is the part we're going to read. Luke 19 Verse 27, at the end of that parable, he says, the, 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 the king, the one who is proclaiming his kingdom and coming back to get it, he says, but bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them. And he says, and slay them before me. Now, here's what's interesting about this. What is he about to do? He's about to go into Jerusalem He's about to go into victoriously, although peacefully, he's about to go into Jerusalem. And as he goes into Jerusalem, what is his, what is, what is the top of his mountain look like? It looks like a what? A cross. So that he can do what? Slay every enemy that keeps you from being who he has called you to be. In this, in that parable, he says, there was one making excuses that said, well, well, I, I couldn't do anything with the minus because I ran into opposition. And Jesus says, you bring everyone who opposed the kingdom and you bring them here and I will deal with that. Book of Romans chapter 8 verses 7 and 8 says that a carnal mind, a fleshly mind is enmity or hostile or an enemy to the work of God in our life. So when Jesus is proclaiming what he's about to be victorious over, he's about to be victorious over every enemy that keeps you from knowing him and getting close to him. Every carnal thing that we deal with, Every flesh-filled attitude and weakness that we have, Jesus says, I want to deal with it. I'm going to slay it. I'm going to put it under the blood. So as he says this, he knows what he's doing, what he is slaying. He's slaying the enmity with, called sin. Because the Bible says that he didn't just bear our sin. He became our sin. And when he let his flesh be torn and his life be slain, he says, the enemy, the sin that keeps you from getting close to God, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to deal with that. So there, he's done that for you. No excuses. He's dealt with that. He's done that. On the cross, that's what he did. 
He took care of every enemy that would keep you from knowing Him and having a relationship with Him. He, he has dealt with everyone victoriously on the cross. We have no excuses. And this is why 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, if you're, going to, if you're going to do the Lord's Supper, make sure that you remember and be in the right mindset that this is not about, uh, this is not about just stuff on a table and this is not about uh, uh, just going through a ritual. This is about understanding what He's done for you and remembering that. And He says, if you do this in a way where you don't care about any of that stuff, you're doing it in an unworthy way. So today, before we go any further, I want you to just let that sit on your mind that you understand what Jesus has done for you. I'm here in about four minutes. We're going to get the children and get them to come back and we're going to dim the house lights and we're going to go into the remainder of our worship. But we're going to do this in two separate stages. Communion is going to be two separate stages today. Normally, I know it's a little bit different. We just we come up during worship and we take the juice and we take the bread and we remember but this one's going to be a little different first thing we're going to do is take the juice so as we later when I tell you it's time and I invite you up to take the juice I want you to come up if you have kids or a family you want to come up with them that's fine you come up and you can take the juice and I want you to just take a moment and remember that Jesus has slain every enemy every enemy that has kept you from knowing Him. Even death itself, even death cannot keep you from getting close to Him. No matter how unworthy we may feel, He's got you covered. No matter how unworthy we may feel, He's taking care of it. Another symbol of that is you remember when Judas was with the 12 disciples and Jesus or the other 11 disciples and Jesus and Jesus says somebody's going to betray me. And they're all saying not me, surely not me. Oh no, not me, not me. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. And, fight. and then someone says, "Ooh, who is it? Everybody likes a good juicy drama. Right? Someone's like, who is it? Jesus, tell me. Who is it? John asks, who is it? Tell me. Let me know. Who is it? And Jesus says, the one that I dip and give it to, that's the one. And we know that he does that. Now, in their culture, what they would do is they would take some of the bread and they would wrap it around some of the lamb meat and they would dip it in either the juice of the lamb or in the wine or sometimes maybe even both they would dip it in that and in their culture who they would give that to is the preferred guest of the entire night it's crazy that Jesus not only washed the feet of his betrayer but also took the bread that he knew represented him and dipped it in the meat or the juice or the, the, the wine that represented his blood. And he says, out of all of you today, the one I'm lifting up the most is the one that's about to betray me. I'm, I'm, you are the preferred guest at my table today. Why would he do something so crazy like that? Because we've all betrayed him. Every one of us have made them decisions that didn't honor God like he deserved to be after he did all of that for us. And he says, yet you are still a preferred guest at my table. I'm wrapping you in the bread of my presence and I'm making you my preferred guest. So as we get ready to do that, I'm actually now, Pastor Steph, if you don't mind going and getting the children and letting them come on in and then I'll kind of give you the lowdown on the rest of what we're going to be doing. If you have your Bibles, let's go one more passage of scripture while they're doing that. Luke chapter 22, just a few pages over. Luke chapter 22 and verse 35. And this is after he has done the 
Passover, after he's done the Lord's Supper, and after he has this moment with Peter and, and he predicts Peter's denial, and after he does that, he brings back the answer to a question that all the disciples have had days, weeks, maybe months, maybe even a year or two before. And that is, how many of you remember the story where Jesus takes his disciples and he tells them, I want you to go do my work, go preach the kingdom of God, go heal the sick, go touch those, go serve those in there, you know, around in Jerusalem and in the Jewish part of the community. Go serve them, go do that. And he says, while you do that, do not take an extra bag of money. In fact, don't even hardly take any money at all. Don't take an extra staff. Don't even take a staff in some cases. Don't take extra shoes or a change of clothes. Don't take any. Just go and depend on me. How many of you remember that? Raise your hand if you remember him saying that. If you don't remember, then uh, read your Bible or raise your hand and act like you remember. One of the two. Right? When, and, and he says that, and this was a huge lesson for his disciples to do what? To learn how to depend on God for everything. And so as he is talking in the Lord's Supper at the end of that, and he's now just talking with them and teaching with them and conversing with them, listen to what he does. Luke twenty two thirty five. And he said to them, When I sent you without a money bag or a knapsack or extra sandals, did you lack anything? And so they said what? Nothing. 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 As if to say, that's why I'm giving you everything, so that you can lack nothing. That's why I'm pouring out everything, so that you can have everything. That's why I'm willing to give my most vulnerable moment to all of the human race who wants to come get it so that you in your weakest moments can actually have your greatest strength. He wants you to know that not only is He slaying your enemies, but He wants to cover you and give you everything you need through what He has done. So at this time, can you go ahead and turn off the, the lights? And Pastor Jonathan, PJ, you want to go ahead and come on up? So here's, here's how we're going to do this. I told you the very first one, we're doing this in like two separate sections, and I know you're going to get up and move and get up and move and get up and move. That's okay. You, you came today to uh, get, get, your, get your exercise on, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remember that He has slain your enemies and He has given you everything you need in His sacrifice for you. And... Jesus says, this is the blood of my covenant. That's the juice, right? The blood of my covenant. And a covenant is something two parties enter into to put the purpose of the covenant above their own selfish needs. We call it a marriage, right? If you've entered into a marriage, what you've done, if you, as you, you, in God's eyes, you've entered into a covenant with one another, willing to put the covenant of the marriage above yourself. That's why the Bible says submit one to another, right? When Jesus passes this cup and says, this is the blood of my covenant, take it, He's saying that I am putting before even my own flesh and, and self, I'm putting the covenant ahead of everything. And as you do it and you remember it, I want you to say, Lord, I put this covenant ahead of my flesh as well. If ahead of all the, my selfish, carnal desires, I put it ahead of that. I remember every drop of blood you gave for me so that I can give you my life in return. And that's how you take it worthily. After we do this, you can come up, you can get your juice, you can go back if you feel com more comfortable going there. You can hang out up front, you can go to the altar, 
whatever, individually, individually. And I know parents may need to help their, their, their kids. That's fine. But individually, I want you to remember what Jesus has done for you. And individually, I want you to give back to him a, a moment of your time, your prayer, your praise, your trust, your faith. If you've, not, if you've never received salvation, now is your time to do so. If you've never officially received salvation, if you've never officially said, Jesus, I want you Lord of my life, now is the time to do so. I'm going to ask you and invite you to do that and then go take of the juice to remember that. After we take a moment and worship and pray and do that, then I'll have you come back up and take the bread and I will talk about that for like two minutes as we do that but we're doing this two separate for a reason and we're going to get there all right so before we get too ahead of ourselves let's just pause for a moment every eye closed and let's think let's think about this now as they begin to sing Whenever you're ready, come get the juice. And let's have a meal. And let me reveal who I am. I'm your Savior. And I will kneel down and wash all the sin from your soul. Servant, and I am all you need. I'm the lamb that was slain, and my blood washes you clean. I'm the pure sacrifice. And that Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for, for what you have done for us. We commune with you in this moment as we remember you, what you have done for us. We commune, Lord God, with you. Knowing also, Lord, that you have given us a way to commune with you spiritually any day, any moment, any time that we ever need you. I thank you for that. I thank you for that opportunity, Lord God, that I get to commune with you in this moment, but not just this moment. Every, every day I can commune with you through the blood of your covenant and your Holy Spirit in your word, the word of God. Thank you, Lord. 
And I pray, Lord, today that we not take this lightly, that we remember what you have done for us, that this sets us up for a great resurrection moment, for a great resurrection time, that this moment of remembering your blood and us now pouring our life out to you sets us up for a great resurrection. A resurrection. A resurrection moment where you raise us up to be more than we could ever hope to be. Thank you, Lord. And if you have done so, and if you're thankful for what he's done by giving us his blood, would you say amen? Would you say amen? Come on and say amen. Like from the bottom of your heart, say amen. Amen. Now we're going to go into the, the bread part and to extend just a little bit further on what I was talking about earlier. The salvation came to the family. Salvation came to the family. The blood covered the family. Covered the whole home. Salvation came to that. Church, we are a family. That's why we chose to call this Rock Creek family. Church, we are a family. And so when Jesus takes the bread and he, he says, this is my body, and, and as he tears it, he's saying that I'm allowing my flesh to be torn so that my heavenly Father can put this all back together, put my life back together so that as I'm resurrected, I'm giving you a wholeness and a completeness, a wholeness that, that my heavenly Father has put me back together. That's why not a bone could be broken on the cross. And he looks at his disciples and he gives them a piece of bread and he says, now remember this. And then he goes on a little bit just a few minutes later and explains. The world will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. So a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So he says as he is taking the body and he was separating it out, and then he was challenging them to put the body back together, to allow God to put the body back together. What he is saying is, is that you are stronger when you are together. That I'm birthing my church, and my church is going to be my what? My body. You understand that the world out there gets the presence of God represented to it through the church. That's why in Revelation, he takes the church out. And the Antichrist does what he wants to do. We hold the presence of God here in this church. In the Old Testament, the bread of presence was before the Ark of the Covenant because it was in the area of service. It was in the area of service. So we love God by the way we love one another. We serve God by the way we serve one another. We put the body of Christ back together by the way we come together. That's why Paul says, I don't want you to do as others think they, they can do. I want you to keep assembling yourself together. So I want you to think for just a moment before we come up. I want you to come individually, get your piece of bread, but as you do, as you take that, I want you to think about who in this room you could pray for. I want to encourage you to assemble. Get a partner. Buddy up. This is the Holy, Holy Spirit buddy system. Buddy up. And as you take it, I want you taking it with them. Does that make sense? So individually come get your peace, but then don't take of it, don't partake of it, until you are with somebody that you want to pray for, pray with. I know it's a challenge to get some, I know it gets you out of your comfort zone a little bit, but somebody knows everybody in here, even if it's your, even if it's your husband or wife, whether you want to know them or not, there they are. Just get with someone and assemble together. Everybody got their buddy? Everybody thought about it? You got your buddy? As they begin to sing, I want you to do that. Come get the bread. 
Find someone, pray with them, and then y'all take it together.
we love you, God. you're doing inside of us, God, is getting ready. It's getting ready to push through the topsoil and burst out and grow and blossom. And the fruit is going to be like anything we've never seen before. And I thank you, God, that through that process, we are closer to you. Closer to one another as a family in this place today. 
Lord, we thank you. We honor you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you give him some praise and tell him thank you this morning. Amen. All right. Well, I could linger for a while, to be honest. It's time to go. So thank you, Brother Ryan. Everybody, give, give Ryan a good old hand. Not just for preparing the bread, but the word. So good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all to each and every one of you that were here today. Thank you so very much. God bless you and have a wonderful week.